when I was asked to speak uh, about creativity and anxiety, I wasn't quite sure what to say about this because I normally don't uh, think of myself that way. For years, I would just do whatever I wanted to do. I didn't care what people thought. Honestly, I really didn't. And, um, and even in life, I would just do things spontaneously it, it, without thinking about it that much um, until more recently. Um, but to kind of give you an idea of where I was before I got to where I am now, this is a picture of me painting a, a, my flat in London. Um, it's a story that kind of uh, fits the personality that I, I'd say I used to have. It's, it's a little different now, but I uh, was traveling in Europe for a couple months, and the evening before I was supposed to fly back to the States, I met some people that were, they had a flat and they wanted to move into it and they needed another roommate, and I thought, yeah. So I didn't get on the plane, I just didn't go home. Um, that's just kind of the way I would, I just make a spontaneous decision and, and do that. Um, but I also used to do very different type of work. I would uh, do a lot of paintings. I, um, this is a painting of a friend of mine, a uh, handful of details. There would be a lot of things hidden within the paintings that kind of help tell stories about the person. Um, this is another one, kind of narratives. You could zoom in and um, find some of the elements and start to figure out you know, what's going on, why is this baby um, suspended from these other things. Um, but I also used to teach painting. And this is a demo painting that I did uh, for one of my classes. I felt like I was doing art that um, kind of went with what I was teaching. Um, but the problem was I started getting bored with painting. Um, this is a project that I did. I teach a lot of digital stuff too. Super silly project. And you take Photoshop, you take a, a picture of one of the, I took a picture of one of the students and then they used themselves. Merge the person into the painting and then that's, you know, a simple little project. But then I, decided, oh, that image works pretty well. I'm going to use that as a demo in my painting class. So I was talking about the uh, uh, grisaille technique, where you paint in black and white and then glaze colors on top. So this would be a detail of the black and white, and then this would be the detail after the colors were glazed on top. So I was kind of explaining that to him, saying, here's, here's grisaille, black and white, separate tones um, from hues, things like that. Well, at about the time that I was doing that, um, I was in a show at the Boise Art Museum with another artist. The, he did the painting on the left, and he wasn't around to pick up the painting, so he asked me to pick it up, and so I had it in my studio for a few days, and really quickly decided to do a portrait of him. So I uh, painted from his painting um, with a, a portrait of him, black and white first, but only focused on the background because I was afraid the painting would be taken away too fast, so I didn't really think about the foreground very well. Um, but I figured it didn't matter. I could just put whatever color shirt on him and it would be fine. Um, although I didn't really like that color of green, so I switched it to a different green when I put the frame, frame on it, and then I realized I didn't like that color of green. So I tried red, and I thought, what if it's blue? And then I tried blue, and I didn't like that. And so I finally just put a jacket on him. <laughs> but, um, so sometimes I think things out, and sometimes I don't. But, uh, but at about the same time, this is one of the last paintings that I kind of did, I guess. Um, not, not this painting. This is by Ang, the artist. I'm sure a lot of you recognize it. But I did a painting based on that, and this girl Diane uh, was in the painting. Um, lots of modern things, CDs and whatnot um, on the uh, surface behind her, photographs, the candle, a whole bunch of things that weren't in the original painting. But anyway, this painting ended up getting a little bit of attention, which kind of surprised me. And in fact, it's in a book about Aang that's only in French and only available in the Louvre in Paris, um, which is kind of weird, um, but kind of fun um, to be in a, a, a big book like that and one of my paintings. But then I thought uh, I was already bored with painting, so I stopped painting. So I got to the point where maybe people were recognizing it and I just didn't feel like doing it anymore. Before I move past this, though, I want to talk about the shape of the paintings, because you probably noticed a lot of these things have these weird shapes. I thought it was, if I put a curve on top, it'd kind of give you this nice classical feel, and uh, kind of like, you know, the Roman aque aqueducts, that kind of shape, the Arc de Triomphe, very nice. The Colosseum, I thought, oh, this is working. This is making people think of this kind of stuff, and there's nothing that could derail that kind of, uh, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> so then when I realized the Taco Bell sign was the same shape, I kind of <laughs> stopped doing that, too. Um, and also, um, after living in London for a while, I ended up being there for about nine months. After um, not moving back, I ended up staying for about nine months. And then when I came back, um, I'm originally from Omaha. And when I got to Omaha, because I had nowhere to live, I had no job, I had nothing, 
Um, they were starting the lead jungle at the time, and uh, they were trying to find some local people that could help, and they just took me in and toured me around in the space. And this is about what it looked like when I first got there. Most of the pillars were just metal, and two of the trees had been done, and they didn't look very good, and they toured me around and said, do you think you can do this? And I said, sure. <laughs> I don't know, I've never done it, why not? Um, so that's what I did for a while. Um, that's actually me. Um, so it looked like this early on. Um, and then when the plants came in, it looked like that. And then when the plants are doing really well, it looked like that. So you don't really see my work very much, but, <laughs> but I did a lot of work um, there for a while. But it was a fun project. I'd never worked like this before. Um, it you know, made me pretty interested in uh, continuing this kind of work for a little while. Um, and the, our crew are specifically, I would paint so fast that I'd have nothing to do, so I ended up being one of the lead sculptors eventually, so they hired me as a painter, but I became the lead sculptor because I was just working faster than everybody, but we would go through all this work to make the trees look realistic and convincing, and these are kind of rainforest trees, so these aren't traditional trees, they're really goofy trees. Um, paint all the lichen on it, do all that kind of stuff, and then these wires would be sticking out, and the next thing you know, they'd put a fire alarm on it, kind of spoil the <laughs> effect a little bit, but... Um, but then I moved to Montreal. They asked me to work at a place called the Biodome, and I worked on that project for a while. Um, was living in Montreal for like a half a year. Um, but then I decided I didn't want to work for that company anymore, um, so I just kind of left. I just like, nah, I'm bored with this, and I just came back to the States. And then a few months later, uh, somebody called me up from a different company and said, hey, you want to live in Africa? I said, damn straight, I want to live in Africa. <laughs> so I moved to Africa for a while. Um, working on this crazy project called The Lost City. Massive, massive project. A lot of people working on this project. And I did this for a while. This is a big wave pool. Um, one of the bridges we did, this waterfall, that little space where the kids are poking out. If you remember that, I could show you um, some of the stuff. This is my crew. That's me down in the bottom right and then kind of up in the top right. This is that waterfall right down in here. Um, was where the kids would be poking out, so it's like 60 feet tall, but none of the rock work, none of, this, none of this stuff existed. The idea was that it was a city destroyed by a volcano, and he, this billionaire had uncovered it and, uh, and turned it into a resort. It's, it's insane. I could talk about this for a long time, um, the kind of stuff they did. So it was fun, and I was making money hand over fist. It was kind of insane. Um, but I got tired of that, too. I get bored of things really fast. I think that's probably the theme. It's not anxiety, it's just I get bored really fast. But I also decided maybe it was time to go back to graduate school. And I started doing this kind of work instead. So I just kind of leave everything behind. Oh, that's right. I talked with uh, Steve uh, Gordon and Megan Hunt at a, a morning talk show that Amy Mather does. That they were talking about branding and how they all stick to what they do. And, and I was talking about, well, I do it for a while, and then I give it up and do something else. And like, yeah. Steve was like, what the hell? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? <clears throat> but I decided to work on this for a while. And these were like little uh, kind of altar pieces, I guess you could say. You open it up, and then there's um, a whole bunch of stuff inside. This one's kind of like a dollhouse. But there are even little panels that pull down from the rooms that describe different uh, things about her. So I had to learn how to bend wood. I had to learn how to put, you know, cut complicated things, spaces. It was, it was kind of crazy. But I learned a lot about woodworking. Um, it was a detail of a bedroom. I mean, the muddy footprints, the Vaseline, the pictures in the everything has something to do with something. Even the wallpaper. You look at the wallpaper from one angle, it's these nice stripes. You look at it from another angle, then you kind of see that there's people and things inside there. Did another one about my uncle, who had passed away from MS um, recent, or just before this. I made a little shrine to him. He was a chemist before he got his doctorate, so I wanted to have some chemistry things. and. Um, he uh, had his ashes spread, so all these leftover stuff from the project when I was creating the, a book for it, I burned, and that's in there, his stethoscope. Uh, some notes that talk about multiple sclerosis and how it affected him. I went through all of their saved documents and uh, turned, so that's the old original stuff over there, turned it into the book, um, reproduced his wallet <laughs> and all of his uh, legal documents in case something happened. I didn't want somebody to steal it. Um, but it turns out I was doing something illegal, oops. Um, <clears throat> the little secret doors and stuff where you could find um, additional information. And then I'm not showing you all these, but I did a whole bunch of these kind of um, altarpiece things. 
And then I got recognized as a sculptor by the International Sculpture Center and Sculpting Magazine as one of the top 25 MFA sculptors and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, all right, I don't want to do sculpting anymore. <laughs> so I stopped doing that. <coughs> and uh, I also thought that these pieces were so complex and I was working so huge and I was doing all this crazy stuff that maybe I just wanted to work small for a while. So I had this little sketch where I said, maybe make 25, 50 of these little pieces, had little reliquary things, and I would just do this nice little tiny thing. Went back to the Photoshop thing, so that's me Photoshopped into somebody else's painting um, for it to become an icon. So this is one of the actual icons, and that's actual, well, that's bigger than actual size, but if my hand was that big. Um, and I just started cranking these things out, and, uh, and I think I was somewhere around 50, and two museums wanted to exhibit it at the same time, and I didn't want to turn down one of the museums, so I just cranked out a whole bunch more and sent them to both, and then when they came back, and I had 100, I thought, oh, that looks better. Maybe I shouldn't give myself an end date, just keep going. So eventually there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things, so I'm probably close to 900. Um, these exhibits, the Paris Gibson Museum and the St. George Museum were about 600 icons each, um, but eventually they were about 900 or so. I'll show you a few of them really fast. So there's an image, became that icon. Another image, became that icon. There's Kevin, <laughs> became that icon. So I just did this like a machine um, on and off for years. And then everybody's like, oh, you're the icon guy. You're, it's I'm like, Why, I've got a name now? OK, no more icons. And I stopped that project. Um, but then the other thing that was happening, kind of guerrilla style, nobody knew about these projects for a long time until I got in trouble um, multiple times. <laughs> um, but uh, I was doing things like before we went to a war with Iraq years ago. I thought, what? what? What are we doing here? What's going on? Super juvenile. I can be incredibly juvenile, for those of you who don't know me. I bought cases of urinal cakes and carved the word <laughs> war into them and just went everywhere. I went into the Supreme Court building for the state of Nevada. I went into the governor's mansion. I went into Harry Reid's offices. I went into, I went in everywhere, everywhere I could. All the senators and just dropping these things in uh, government buildings. Um, super juvenile, super juvenile. And then, um, um, I made a piece about 9-11, um, and every year I would install it kind of guerrilla style, random place. I didn't know where I was going to do it. I realized the date was there, and I thought, oh, shit, I've got to install it somewhere. So for about 10 years, I just kept uh, installing this piece until a terrorism task force, force found it and called me in, and I got in trouble, and now I have a file. But I also got in trouble for confronting one of the presidents, and the Secret Service took me away, so I have a file for multiple reasons. But, but my art seems to get me into trouble, but for some reason that doesn't stop me. Um, right now I've got a project going where I print uh, vomit bags, barf bags, and I put them onto planes. I printed like eight... <laughs> I've printed about 8,000... <laughs> I've printed about 8,000 of these things, and I've got a lot of friends helping me out, and, uh, and I'll, I'll just be on a plane, I'll put them down, and then I'll sit and just wait until other people find them, and then we find them, and they take a picture. I take a picture of them taking the picture when I can. <laughs> and then uh, people have gotten creative, and they've, they start taking them other places, and, and, uh, and what I do is I tweet directly at the president, so I tweet images of these. My name's President Shitgibbon on Twitter, at Make America Barf. And then I tweet these images with hashtags and his uh, Twitter handle. He's never responded to me, but, but that's one of the things I do. Um, I also was uh, working on this project, kind of still working on it, I guess, um, about Citizens United, where I stamp money, which everybody keeps telling me is illegal, and I would contend that it's not, but I keep doing it anyway until somebody takes me away. So, and I stamp it with the Koch brothers' faces um, as a way of, um, you know, addressing where the money's coming from. Thousands and thousands of dollars, I don't know how many thousands of dollars I've stamped and spent. Um, and my favorite one are the $2 bills, because on the $2 bills I can have one of them saying, corporations are not people. And then I have another stamp that says, duh, and that's what everybody else is saying, but... <laughs> and I use Tumblr for that. Somebody said, oh, use Tumblr. So I started using Tumblr, and, uh, and then I found out, I thought, oh, Tumblr's a good site, that's what everybody recommended. Nobody goes to this one, Twitter. That one gets a lot of reaction. Tumblr? No. And then I asked somebody about it, and they said, well, Tumblr's for porn. <laughs> when, when, when did that happen? <laughs> uh, but uh, I also had this obsession with nuclear testing, so I uh, created this project. It was just about um, 
the United States nuclear testing program. I'm going to skip forward in this video a little. Um, there were uh, four video projection screens that had um, explosions going on and an, an experimental animation that I did. Oh, I can't turn the volume up here. But anyway, so you'd, you'd uh, flip through that and it would show you a whole bunch of different things. There was also this little scale that I created up to the wall, so it started at the wall. One kiloton of explosive power equaling one foot. This is a horrible way to do this, but that's what I did. Um, so Hiroshima would be about 15 feet from the wall. The, the Trinity bomb would be about 21 feet from the wall. Nagasaki, about the same. So, you know, 15 feet from the wall. And then um, tried to uh, get people to understand the difference of these bombs, because everybody still thinks Hiroshima when they think nuclear weapons. We used to do land surveying. We went out as land surveyors and punched those little things into the ground all over Omaha. And um, the biggest one, and then had a map, so you could look at this map and find some of these things. And, and again, geocache, so if you were a geocacher, you'd go locate all these things. So the biggest test that was done would have been 25 miles from the wall. So Hiroshima, 15 feet, 25 miles. That's the difference of, of the, these bombs. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, and then I started working with the Hiroshima Peace Museum and a bunch of people in Japan, um, actual Habakusha survivors of the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and ended up with tons of cranes. Actually, I needed uh, 1,054 cranes hanging from the ceiling because that's how many detonations we've done as a country, just ours. Um, but I got so many that I just had them all over the place. I used a whole bunch of uh, government images. So when they were blowing up bombs, they were taking stereo photography of those things. And then I also made my own stereo photos. So if you look into those little holes, you'd actually feel like you were standing there. Um, explosions going on in the background if you were a tourist and very uh, alternative history. <laughs> Just this crazy exhibition with all of this stuff, actual trinitite, that's at the ground, the sand that got melted into glass underneath the first explosion. There'd be a um, fallout shelter in there and everything. And it was fun researching that and doing all that stuff, but then I stopped. Although now I'm actually thinking of bringing it back because of the weird discussions that are going on. But, um, but I explored it and then thought I was going to move on. Then I started doing some drawings. Now, I don't normally draw. Mine's the one in the middle. Those are two other artists on the side. Um, because I was working on a project that I was calling Extraordinary Rendition, and it was about the United States practice of extraordinary rendition. So I wanted to um, explore that. And I thought one fun way to do it would be to create these drawings. These drawings are about six foot tall. So this is the detail of that one. And so the idea is you were coming to see these drawings for the show, but I was doing something else behind the scenes. So the drawings were a nice excuse to say, hey, here's the art. But in reality, what I was doing was trying to freak people out about a lot of things. So you'd come into the show. This is old Bemis Underground. I don't know how many people remember the Bemis Underground. But you'd go in to the space, and then you'd get your drinks. But as you were getting your drinks, she would be dropping pills in your drinks. And some people would notice and freak out, and some people wouldn't. And then, so you're already freaked out about that. And then you're trying to get into the show, and they're taking your picture and kind of fingerprinting you. And you're like, I just want to see a show. And there, uh, it's, it was a, a, an insane amount of security that was going on as you were walking into the show, um, including dogs. <laughs> um, and then you get there, and you finally see the drawings, and you think, oh, great. Here's the drawing. Oh, the yellow footprints. Oh, I must stand there. That's my best viewing point for the drawing. Um, but actually, the reason the footprints were there and the reason the rope was there so you couldn't get too close was so the cameras that were recording everybody that walked into the show <laughs> could get good uh, shots of everybody. So all of that video, there's video being sent from one place. This is a different one. This guy's monitoring um, other people. And this guy's monitoring the people uh, that came to the show. So he's watching you and writing things down. But that's all kind of behind the scenes. You don't know this is happening until you get into the show. I also um, work with a lot of people that um, I admire. This is uh, Justin Kemmerling over here. I decided I wanted to have a kind of a propaganda side of the show, and then I wanted a, a set side of the show that gave you a lot of information. So that was the information. This is the propaganda documents. Um, cheap gas and cheeseburgers. This is from the actual document. We were collecting information from the CIA, anything that was actually published that we knew. It turns out the Extraordinary Rendition Program is much bigger and much worse than what we knew, but what we could find out is what we uh, put in the show, only stuff that we could verify, basically, um, up to 2010. And then Doug Hako uh, was doing a performance where they were beating the crap out of a 
a terrorist suspect in the back of the room. And I thought, well, that was fun to explore, but you know, everybody's talking about that now. I can kind of move on, which uh, actually um, turned out not to be the case. I probably should have kept doing it. I also have an interest in environmental things um, and doing digital stuff. The Fontenelle Forest had asked me to do a presentation or uh, be a part of a, an exhibition. And I decided rather than creating something in the forest, I would create something digital and then mark it in the forest. So I worked with a bunch of geocachers and we went, I gave them the coordinates and they just went around and plugged these um, into the forest. And then, um, and then there was a little pamphlets that explained stuff so you could download them and, and find this out if you wanted. And then there was a website that you could go and explore and find where those were and, and explain um, what the points were. And there was also a video uh, with the computer that was inside. So it was kind of interesting to me to do all that. Actually, I I've got some of the video here. This is also um, Google's thing to create buildings and things on the Earth so you can make everything 3D. Instead of making little buildings that fit on the Earth, I decided to make this magnifying glass that was much bigger than the Earth and you kind of um, go through the magnifying glass down to Omaha, down to Fontenelle Forest, and then you find um, each of these things. I'm not going to let this play the whole thing because it's too long, but you could go in and, and explore each of the points and find out what um, each of those things were about. Um, then Fontenelle said, well, we kind of want something physically in the forest. Can you do that? And I'm like, ah. So I went ahead and, over oh, the span of a couple days, I just really quickly grabbed a whole bunch of logs that were on the ground. Um, suspended them in the air, painted them colors, and then when you walked, it kind of created a scar as you were walking down the path because they lined up. Uh, another piece that um, was actually a solo show that I was supposed to do at Metro, and when I was asked to do it, I had this whole show figured out, scheduled. I was going to do all these, this work, and then as that was happening, that's when the BP oil spill happened, and this is like a week before I'm supposed to install the show. I went to the gallery director and said, I, I want to do a new piece. I'm not going to do any of the stuff that I said. He's like, uh, are you sure you can get it done in time? I said, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> and then, so I started getting live feeds from the uh, bottom of the gulf and would project them onto one side of a screen. And the screen actually would capture the light in boxes. And from the other side, you would get this pixelated effect. So it was this idea that they were giving us um, only some of the information that was happening and the reality was on the other side. So again, playing around with it, a reality concept. Um, did another environmental one with uh, Jamie Burmeister. He had this cool bike controller thing, and uh, he wanted to create a, a video where you could ride a bike through a forest or something like that. And then I said, what if we took the bike and made it control other things? So you're not just riding, but you're actually trying to save the planet, for example. That's Jamie. So the idea was, as you pedaled, you would lower this flooding water level. If you didn't pedal fast enough, the intersection would flood. And if you looked forward through the space, you'd see a bunch of walls that were the projections for it. But if you took down those walls, that was the scene that you would have uh, seen. So I just reconstructed that Vinton Street area uh, virtually. Let me skip forward a little bit. Actually, you probably won't be able to hear it, but somewhere in here. I wanted to hear Godzilla. Ah, oh, it's not loud enough. <laughs> Godzilla appears. Lots of weird things appear. It's kind of, it was kind of fun to make, but <laughs> interesting to talk about, you know, environmental stuff. I was also doing some documentary stuff with uh, Creighton. We've got a, a backpack journalism program that a bunch of people are involved in, faculty and, and students. Um, so I was doing a little bit of that work, but the, what I was doing most at the time was kind of these experimental animations. This is for Prairie Schooner and, um, and Lincoln. Um, and this is the video that you saw. Um, and then this one was a video that's actually the very end of an interactive novel. So the novel is read while you interact with all these different uh, devices and, and things, um, which was fun to make. I like, learned Maya um, just to make this thing. And in fact, <laughs> I was working on another animation for somebody else. Um, I don't know if the guy that controls the volume, if he can turn it up, not, you may not be able to hear this unless we turn the volume up if he's nearby. Um, but I was working on this, and I mean, it's the refraction of the glass and all the details, and there's, there's an amazing amount of work that I was putting into this and teaching myself the program at the same time, and realized um, this is taking a lot of time to try to create this animation. Only one little video clip exists, and this is Mark reading the poem. I don't think you're going to be able to hear it, unfortunately, but we'll try it. 
The angel said it had almost been caught. I sheltered in a church, but they refused to acknowledge us. They're striking us from the record, saying we never existed. Hey, well, but the, as the poet reading uh, about this uh, angel creature, which is uh, really cool, and I really would have loved to, loved to have finished it, <clears throat> but I also learned not to just jump on new projects because it's interesting, and not just to give up or to stop working on a project because I was done with it. I also learned to give up projects because it, it, there was just no way it was going to happen. I mean, I was working about 10 hours for every second, and that, that wasn't going to work. And about this time, I was also getting to the point where um, I wasn't sure if I was going to continue making art. Art was uh, something that I was doing my whole life, but it was also taking up time that I thought maybe I needed to devote elsewhere. I was still trying to uh, figure that out. But I went ahead and did this project where I thought, I'm going to just give away one piece of art for every day of the year, and only to people who've, who've come up to me and said, oh, I, I would love to have one of your pieces of art, but I can't afford it. And I'm like, all right. So those, that group of people that can't afford to buy art, that don't have original art on their walls, et cetera. In fact, I had a collector approach me and said, oh, this is so exciting. I can't wait to have it. And when I realized who it was and what she was saying, I said, you, you don't get one. She was really upset. <laughs> I think apparently I upset a couple of collectors. But um, but it wasn't for that 1%. It was for the people that never had original art. So I went ahead and did it. I gave away pretty much all those icons, um, a whole bunch of other, oh my god. <laughs> Sorry, a Trump notification just popped up on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. Um, uh, so a whole bunch of little encaustic paintings, a lot of prints, a lot of um, larger pieces, no, medium-sized pieces, little oil sketches. These are um, small things. I did a lot of oil sketches, gave those away. Ultimately, um, I ended up giving away, I think it was um, about 500 pieces of artwork. So it was more than one a day, but, it, but at least I made my goal. It's at least one piece a day. Um, and again, 500 is what it came out to. Um, and at the time, like I said, I was kind of trying to move back from art, and I thought, well, what a nice way to end it. If I'm, if I'm not going to be doing art, I'll just give all this stuff away. But I also had this one thing that I kind of really wanted to do. I refer to it as the Museum of Alternative History. And I started it a few years ago, and it was going to become this bigger thing, which it will at the Coneco this coming summer, if I don't talk about that later. Um, but this was the first version. It was kind of like a little Petri dish. I thought, let's make a whole bunch of these different things different um, objects and items. These I did on a 3D printer. And then um, create stories behind them. So there's writers involved, um, visual artists, etc. And it's about cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias. There's, a, there's kind of big concepts wrapped up inside this whole show. And a group show, I'm showing you my stuff, but it's, it's a group show with a lot of people. And if you get a chance to see the Kaneka one, the stuff people are coming up with is just, it's going to be really cool. Um, I would take images from NASA. So these are actual images from NASA. That they, they have stereo cameras on the rovers. And I'm a rover freak. I watch what the rovers are doing all the time. And I would take the rover images. And if you look through those as a stereo image, suddenly there'd be something creeping in the side that looked like a, an ant or a bug or something. Or you'd look in the horizon, you'd see oil pumps on the horizon of on Mars, or a drone fly overhead or something like that. But there were things that obviously weren't real. It was just talking about that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, when I was asked to do this, they said, uh, well, it's about anxiety. Why don't you talk about anxiety? And, and like I said, I never really dealt with that very much. I just did stuff. It's no big deal, no big deal. Um, and that changed um, when uh, um, I, I, I'd been a caretaker for my wife uh, for a long time. Not a long time. She got sick, and it got worse, and it got worse. And that's why I was giving up art, was because I needed time to be her caretaker, not to make art. And, um, and then she passed away. And after she passed away, suddenly I was struggling with a lot of things. Um, people kept telling me, oh, go into your studio. That'll help. Just go into your studio. You'll, you'll do well. That'll help you out. Uh, but it didn't. It was fucking miserable. I don't know how else to describe it. You go into your studio, and you think, the only reason I have time to do this is because she's gone. That was a shitty feeling. So I didn't do anything for years. I, the, I, I wasn't doing anything for the couple of years leading up to her death because I was her caretaker, and then I stopped 
um, while she was gone. <clears throat> and one thing I decided to do was something that I wanted to do for her, not, not for art's sake, just I wanted to do. She asked to have her ashes spread. So I created these little 3D spheres and um, filled them with her ashes. And I traveled all over the place, Machu Picchu, Wales, um, that's Wales also, Scotland, oh, this next one's Scotland, um, Iguazu Falls in Argentina. I just went everywhere, just traveling, until I came close to going bankrupt and realized, okay, I need to stop. But I, I traveled Scotland and a whole bunch of other places and kept spreading her ashes. And at that time, I also thought, well, I'm spreading her ashes and I'm going to places where we went on our honeymoon and all that kind of stuff, so maybe I should do something else at the same time. So I would find pictures that I took of her, uh, that this was on our honeymoon, um, visiting my friend Wayne Plowman and, and uh, his wife Pam. And I thought, you know, I'm going to find these places and I'm going to take photos of the photos. You know, those old World War II photos people would take, you know, here's today and this is, you know, here's what happened in World War II and what's it look like today? So simple concept. It's not super creative, not super whatever, but it was something I wanted to do for me. I wanted to go to each of these places. So I did. I, I went and found every possible place that I could and took, um, and I, I kept a blog, so for my friends and family who don't like Facebook, which I totally understand, so they could read about it and, um, and they could see these things. And I just kept posting them. And uh, I ended up posting like 700 posts, um, a ton of posts. And uh, ironically, those of you who know who Pat Oswalt is, Pat Oswalt apparently found the blog and read every page. And now he and I talked a little bit, not really, um, because of, uh, he had a, um, went through a similar um, situation. And it turned out other people were being affected or it helped. So I went ahead and kept it going longer than I would have. I thought I'd do it for a year, and I ended up doing it for about two years. So I just, I literally just ended it on December 31st. I put the last post up and just kind of walked away from it. But that's what I was doing for a long time. And people kept calling it art, and I kept saying it's not art. This is just a process I'm going through, and, and you know, people say, screw you, it is art. <laughs> we can have arguments about it. Um, I hate thinking of it as art because it feels like I'm reducing her to a, an art piece, which really bothers me but it was basically what I was focused on for the past um, two years. So yeah, and that's, now I've got this anxiety. I got this anxiety of this Kaneko show, which I would have probably been able to do years ago without any issue, and I can't get myself to go in the studio, but still fighting that. Um, I, uh, a bunch of writers kept wanting to write about what I was doing, and I kept turning them all away, except eventually I let one or two write something. And a friend of mine who's a filmmaker said, now you're a filmmaker. Maybe you should think about creating a film. And I'm like, no, I don't want to create a film. And I was going to all these places. I was shooting photos anyway, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll shoot some video clips. So I'd distribute your ashes, take a photo, and then go ahead and shoot some video. And then later, um, about a year ago, I put it together and thought, is there a film in there? And there was, and, and it, it apparently affected a lot of people. It ended up winning an awful lot of awards. But, um, but anyway, it's still, it's still a struggle that I'm at. I'm still trying to get through all of this and trying to get back to this space where I can be uh, productive. Um, I don't know if it's anxiety as much as kind of like pure devastation that I was going through, and now I'm just anxious trying to go back. Be becoming a re-emerging artist, I've discovered, is much more difficult than being an emerging artist. It's kind of weird to watch the reaction as I'm trying to do this, but, but um, that's kind of where I was, what I went through. And, and where I ended up, and I'm just putting this Buddha quote up because Beth became kind of a Buddhist, kind of, or she didn't become a Buddhist, she <laughs> would uh, practice some of those things. Um, so I thought I'd leave a quote for her. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>